am not sorry. And I am not sorry for the things I did do. The world has witnessed some of the most abhorrent and irrational acts of violence in its history. What is even more unsettling is the complete absence of remorse exhibited by certain infamous criminals during their trials. As the horrifying details of their crimes were revealed, it became evident that these individuals have no place in a society that respects the law. Some of these offenders openly ridiculed the court and even laughed at their victims. Others adopted a calm and calculated demeanor, devoid of any emotions or guilt for their actions. These criminals demonstrated a blatant disregard for human life, and their trials were marked by a complete absence of empathy. Enlisted below are the ten most notorious murderers who displayed no remorse during their court proceedings. Number 1. Gary Leon Ridgway Gary Leon Ridgway, also known as the Green River Killer, is an American serial criminal who was responsible for the deaths of 49 individuals, making him one of the most notorious serial criminals in U.S. history. His upbringing was difficult, with his mother being seen as controlling by relatives and witnessing violent confrontations between his parents during his early years. Gary suffered from dyslexia and was held back a year in high school. At the age of 16, he stabbed a young person who survived the attack. He eventually graduated from high school and married his high school sweetheart, Claudia Craig, when they were both 19 years old. Gary joined the U.S. Navy and served in Vietnam, where he witnessed traumatic events. Contracting gonorrhea during his time in Vietnam further fueled his anger. He went on to have three ex-wives and multiple girlfriends after his marriage ended. Gary was initially arrested under suspicion, but the investigation uncovered a long list of crimes. He was charged with numerous deaths and was transferred from a maximum security cell to a lower security level tank. On November 5, 2003, he pleaded guilty to 48 counts. In his statement, he admitted to committing the crimes as well as transporting and disposing of the women's bodies near Portland to mislead authorities. He showed no remorse in court and referred to these crimes as his career. He confessed to taking the lives of 49 women in Washington State between 1982 and 1998. He received a life sentence without the possibility of parole in 2003. To avoid the death penalty, he offered to provide information about his crimes and help detectives locate the victims' bodies. Gary's sentence ensures that he will spend the rest of his life in prison, serving as a constant reminder of the horrifying acts he committed and the devastating effect on the victims' families. He demonstrated no remorse for his actions, even when confronted with the judge's statement that he is undeserving of forgiveness and life. The judge also determined that he was mentally sound at the time of his crimes and not mentally challenged. Number 2. Thomas Michael Thomas Michael T.J. Lane, a convicted criminal, gained international attention in 2012 when he carried out a shooting at Chardon High School in Ohio. This incident shocked the entire community. Lane was born and raised in a small village in Ohio and had a difficult upbringing marked by substance abuse, violence, and mental illness. His father was also in prison for various offenses, which left Lane feeling isolated and angry. Despite these challenges, Lane managed to attend high school where he was known as a loner and outcast. On February 27, 2012, Lane entered the school cafeteria and opened fire killing three students and injuring three others. The tragedy stunned the town of Chardon and sparked a national debate on school violence. After the incident, Lane allegedly left the building and was chased by a teacher before being detained outside the school. He was subsequently charged with three counts of aggravated murder, two counts of attempted murder, and one count of felonious assault. Initially, Lane was held as a juvenile pending further legal proceedings. During his trial, Lane displayed little remorse for his actions, often smiling and making offensive gestures in court. He even appeared wearing a t-shirt with an inappropriate word. His defense team argued that he was mentally ill at the time of the shooting, but Lane crossed boundaries by cursing the victim's families and the judge. At the hearing, prosecutor David Joyce announced that he would try Lane as an adult and present three charges against him. Lane admitted to firing 10 rounds during the incident and claimed he did not know the victims, stating they were chosen randomly. However, a witness who knew Lane claimed that he was acquainted with some of the victims. 
Lane ultimately pleaded guilty to all charges without showing any concern for the consequences. In addition to his conviction, Lane and two other inmates escaped from Allen Oakwood Correctional Facility in Lima, Ohio, in September 2014. However, they were apprehended shortly after. The survivors of the Chardon High School shooting continued their efforts to advocate for stricter gun laws and harsher punishments for criminals like T.J. Lane. Number 3. Michael Swanson Michael Swanson became notorious for his involvement in violent and tragic incidents. Born in Iowa in 1993, he struggled with mental health problems throughout his life. Despite these challenges, Swanson showed great intellectual potential. However, his promising future was abruptly cut short at the age of 17 when he committed a double murder. Swanson carried out a robbery at a convenience store in Algona, Iowa, where he shot and killed two employees before fleeing the scene. During a high-speed chase, he was shot in the cheek and eventually apprehended in Minnesota. In 2011, Swanson was found guilty of the crime and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Throughout his trial and the subsequent punishment, Swanson displayed no remorse for his actions. He even showed a lack of empathy by making inappropriate and offensive remarks to the victim's families, often grinning or laughing in court. This behavior shocked and angered many, as they were expecting him to show remorse and offer an apology. When asked how he felt at the time of the crime, Swanson callously stated that he felt powerful. The judge, recognizing his lack of remorse, condemned his actions, deeming any attempts to educate or lecture him as pointless. Swanson's defense attorney argued that his mental health issues, which had a long history, may have contributed to the tragic deaths, suggesting that adequate medical help could have prevented the incident. Swanson remains in prison, serving his sentence while the families of the victims continue to mourn their loss, hoping one day for a genuine expression of regret from him. This case serves as a tragic reminder of how one person's actions can have a profound and devastating impact on the lives of many. Number 4. Michael Elijah Adams Adams, a native of Michigan, has tattoos of railroad tracks and a troubled upbringing in an abusive household. At the age of 14, he ran away from home and began riding trains on his own. It is claimed that Adams crossed paths with one of the founding members of the nearly extinct Freight Train Riders Association, FTRA, a group of hardcore wanderers on one of these trains. This person allegedly took Adams under his wing and helped him rise within the gang, eventually becoming an enforcer responsible for violent acts against those who interfered with the group's drug operations or disrespected its code. In May 2011, Adams was arrested in Oregon during a fight between drifters, and it was then discovered that he had an outstanding warrant in California for the killing of John Smillier Owens, another wanderer. Owens's body had been found in January 2000 on a gravel service road passing through a rail yard in Roseville, California. Despite facing the possibility of life imprisonment, Adams appeared unconcerned and even expressed pride in his actions, looking forward to a comfortable life in a Virginia jail cell. After six months from his arrest, Adams pleaded not guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. However, he remained unfazed by the sentence. In an interview, he boasted about the gang's dominance and their involvement in illegal activities such as weapons, drugs, and women. Adams' previous 30 years of evading authorities and living on the rails didn't bother him, as he believed that all good things must come to an end. Despite attempting to escape prison, he showed no remorse for his actions, proudly stating his satisfaction with what he had done. Thankfully, he was apprehended and transferred to a maximum security prison. While Adams will be eligible for parole in California after 15 years, Virginia prosecutors aim to keep him in the state indefinitely to ensure he serves his entire life sentence. Their request now awaits approval from the governor of California. Adams claims to be collaborating on a book with an author, and there is interest from a major magazine to publish a piece about him. Number 5. Kamiya Gamet Kamiya Gamet, also known as Kamiya Marie, is an American woman who fatally shot her lover Marcella Hill in 2013. Gamut, who was born in 1985, had a troubled upbringing in a violent and dysfunctional environment. She also struggled with mental health issues and had a criminal record that included assault and violent offenses. Prior to the incident, 
Gamut and Hill had been in a relationship for about a year, characterized by violence and cruelty from both parties, according to court documents. Gamut had previously attacked Hill with a knife, demonstrating her abusive behavior. In May 2013, she assaulted Hill at his home in Michigan. Gamut claimed that she acted in self-defense, but the evidence contradicted her statement. Hill suffered 11 stab wounds, six of which were on his back. Gamut also used a table leg and a frying pan to assault him, causing serious head injuries. She was found guilty of first-degree murder during her trial and received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. The brutality of the crime and Gamut's history of abuse and mental health problems attracted global attention to the case. However, her behavior after the incident demonstrated her lack of remorse. During court proceedings, she constantly interrupted, rolled her eyes, and even smiled as Hill's family read a letter. The judge had to threaten her with duct tape to quiet her down. Both Gamut and her lawyer knew that the life sentence was inevitable. The judge reportedly told the family, I agree with the family. I hope you die in jail as well, and if this were a death penalty state, you'd be in the chair. This case exemplifies the importance of addressing domestic abuse and mental health issues. It sheds light on the connection between these two issues and highlights the need for effective intervention and support for individuals with mental health challenges and a history of trauma and criminal behavior. Number 6. Keith Ferguson Keith Ferguson was a resident of Kalkaska County in Michigan and a devoted family man with four children. However, he was found guilty of killing his wife, Tiffany, despite her filing for divorce. The divorce had not been finalized at the time of her death. Investigators discovered that there was a pending divorce between Keith and Tiffany, and certain events may have triggered his violent actions. On November 18th, Keith fatally shot his wife at their home in Cold Springs Township. He then took his four children, aged 3, 9, 11, and 13, to their grandparents' residence in Excelsior Township. While attempting to hold the children hostage, Keith also killed their grandfather, Weber, who tried to intervene. The terrified children sought help from a neighbor, who happened to be a Kalkaska sheriff's deputy. The neighbor immediately contacted emergency services. Simultaneously, Keith called 911 from his home in Orange Township, claiming to have a hostage and threatening to harm any authorities who approached. After a tense seven-hour standoff at a house in Orange Township, Keith was safely apprehended. It was determined that he had not harmed the hostage he was holding. Throughout the court proceedings, Keith displayed minimal remorse for his actions. He was arraigned in Kalkaska District Court and received harsh criticism from the judge, who believed there was something deeply wrong with him. Keith continued to curse the judges and everyone in the courtroom. During the trial, a friend of the victim warned the court about Keith's troubling behavior, to which he responded dismissively. When asked about his interest in maintaining a relationship with his children, Keith showed no desire to see them in the future. Keith was charged with first-degree murder and was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Additionally, he was prohibited from any contact with his four children. However, it was revealed that as the children grow older, they will be allowed to correspond with their father through letters. The victim's family expressed their satisfaction with the punishment handed down to Keith. Number 7. Joseph Paul Franklin Joseph Paul Franklin, an American serial criminal, gained notoriety in the late 1970s and early 1980s through a series of crimes. Born on April 13, 1950 in Mobile, Alabama, Franklin grew up in a challenging environment marked by bigotry and violence. Influenced by his extremist beliefs, he became a white supremacist. In 1977, Franklin committed his first known crime by killing two young black men in Cincinnati, Ohio. This event marked the beginning of his crime spree, where he specifically targeted interracial couples and individuals he believed were Jewish. He believed that Jews were conspiring to take over the government, viewing Jewish civilians as Zionist agents. One of Franklin's most notorious crimes occurred in 1980 when he carried out a shooting spree at a synagogue in Skokie, Illinois, during a bar mitzvah. This act resulted in the death of one person and multiple injuries. Franklin also admitted to shooting and paralyzing an aide to adult film creator Flint as part of an assassination attempt the same year. His motivation for these actions stemmed from his disgust at the portrayal of interracial couples in a magazine. 
In 1980, Franklin was arrested during a routine traffic stop and found to be in possession of firearms and other dangerous weapons. Through ballistics evidence, he was linked to additional crimes and eventually confessed to over 20 homicides. He was also accused of planning and carrying out 16 other crimes, including an attempted assassination of civil rights activist Vernon Jordan. During his 1997 trial in Missouri for the murder of Gerald Gordon, Franklin attempted to escape. He was ultimately found guilty, but a psychiatrist who had extensively assessed him for the defense claimed that he suffered from paranoid schizophrenia and was unfit to stand trial. Franklin granted numerous interviews to the media, stating that he believed he had a divine mission to incite a race war. Due to the complexity of his crimes and his lack of remorse, Missouri decided to use a new form of lethal injection for Franklin's execution. This decision was made after witnessing Franklin's interviews and his apparent lack of torment. Number 8. Ronnie O'Neill Ronnie O'Neill, an American man, gained notoriety for the tragic incident in 2018 when he killed his girlfriend and their nine-year-old daughter. The shocking event had a profound impact on the community, leaving many questioning how someone could commit such a horrendous crime. O'Neill had a challenging upbringing in Florida, facing difficulties such as substance abuse and previous conflicts with the authorities. Despite these obstacles, he managed to hold a job and provide for his family. However, something changed in 2018, and his behavior became increasingly erratic and unpredictable. In a violent act, O'Neill attacked his girlfriend with both a knife and a gun, resulting in the deaths of her and their daughter. He then set fire to their home. Following the incident, O'Neill was apprehended and charged with two counts of first-degree murder. During the trial, he chose to represent himself and claimed that the evidence would prove his innocence, even suggesting a police Illuminati conspiracy. Shockingly, he showed no remorse for his actions, stating that the sacrifice of his girlfriend and child was for a greater cause. In court, O'Neill's son confirmed that his father had also physically abused him. This resulted in O'Neill becoming agitated and accusing the court of playing a fraudulent recording. Despite his attempts to defend himself, O'Neill was found guilty. Additionally, the prosecution accused him of fabricating evidence. Upon delivering the sentence, the judge expressed that this was the most horrific case she had ever encountered, having witnessed many atrocities throughout her career. O'Neill continued to show no remorse for his actions. As a result, he received three life sentences plus 90 years without parole. Furthermore, his son was adopted by the detective who had taken care of him on the night of the incident, providing him a safe and prosperous future. Critics have questioned O'Neill's mental competence to represent himself in court as he displayed irrational behavior. Others have also raised concerns about the legal system's handling of individuals who suffer from mental illness and engage in violent acts. Regardless of these disputes, one thing remains clear. O'Neill's lack of remorse has left a lasting impact. However, his son will now have the opportunity to live a secure and prosperous life. Number 9. Tommy Lynn Sells Tommy Lynn Sells, also known as the Coast to Coast Killer, was a well-known American serial criminal who caused the deaths of numerous innocent people in the U.S., he had a troubled upbringing in a dysfunctional family and claimed to have suffered physical abuse as a child, leading him to run away from home at the age of 16. At the age of seven, Sells began regularly consuming alcohol from his maternal grandfather's supply. Within a year, he started spending time with an adult man named Willis Clark, who he claimed assaulted him. Sells believed that his mother approved of this relationship, which deeply scared and harmed him. Sells started his crime spree while still a teenager, taking his first life at the age of 18 and continued killing throughout his adult life. He was a transient, traveling across the country with the sole intention of committing crimes. His actions were often spontaneous and unpredictable, targeting people of different ages, races, and genders. Sells' criminal activities came to an end in 1999 when he was arrested in Del Rio, Texas, for the murder of Kayleen Harris. He broke into the Harris family's home and fatally stabbed Kayleen while she was in bed. He also attacked Kayleen's friend, Kristen Huddle, who survived and was able to identify Sells as the perpetrator. Following his arrest, Sells admitted to numerous other crimes without hesitation. He even expressed a twisted sense of satisfaction, recalling the thrill he experienced when committing his first crimes. 
Cells claim to have taken the lives of up to 70 individuals, although the exact number remains unknown. In Texas, he was ultimately convicted and sentenced to death in 2000. He was also suspected of committing crimes in various other states such as Arizona, California, Florida, Illinois, Kentucky, Missouri, Nevada, New York, Oklahoma, and South Carolina. However, he was never tried or convicted for these offenses. Sell's story serves as a chilling reminder of the horrors inflicted by serial criminals, as his acts were both cruel and senseless, leaving devastation in their wake. Number 10. Randall Moore Randall Moore, commonly known as Randy, became well-known after being arrested and convicted for the murder of his estranged wife. In addition to killing her, Moore also assaulted her and shot a police officer who responded to the incident. Despite being charged with first-degree murder, Moore showed no remorse during the trial and claimed it was an act of self-defense. However, evidence presented in court contradicted his defense, as the victim was found to be unarmed and shot multiple times at close range. Moore's lack of remorse and attempt to justify his actions, combined with the court's evidence, indicate that he committed a premeditated and heartless crime. During the sentencing, Sheila Lynch, the victim's mother, expressed her anger and disgust towards Moore for taking the life of her daughter. She described his actions as evil and hateful, stating that he had taken away her daughter's life because he couldn't take away her spirit. In response, Moore tried to discredit Lynch by claiming that her daughter despised her, referencing a journal she had written. However, his attempt to justify his actions only further portrayed him as a remorseless and deluded individual. Prior to his sentencing, Moore was given the opportunity to make a statement, which he used to rationalize the murder for over 10 minutes. He expressed no regret for his actions and even hoped that more people would resort to violence in situations similar to his own. These disturbing words shocked those present in the courtroom. The judge had to remind Moore to maintain decorum as his statements were crossing the line. Ultimately, Moore was sentenced to three life terms for his crimes, including the murder of Teresa Lynch and Officer Rowland. The judge described Moore as incredibly evil and unlike anything he had seen before. After the sentencing, Sheila Lynch expressed relief and stated that the day went better than she had expected. With her daughter's assailant behind bars, she and her family can start moving forward. 